Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to Community Bible Study. My name is Patty Peretti. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, today we are talking about John chapter 20, and I'm going to read the first 18 verses uh, before we start. So if you don't have your Bibles with you, please go grab one or grab a smartphone and follow along with me as I read from the Gospel according to John, verses 1 through 18. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. The disciples, then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Let's pray together before we start. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. May you teach us all that it means for us these 2,000 years later. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. John, the gospel writer, wants us to avoid the mistake of considering the cross in isolation from the resurrection. In fact, he wants us to be certain that the cross is the route that Jesus took to return to his Father. It's quite a paradox, really, that the ultimate glorification of the Son with the Father comes through means of glorification on a hideous cross. The cross was the means of the Son returning to his Father. It was the way the Son fulfilled his mission on this earth, which was to bring us to God. And I would say that he wants us to know that the empty tomb is so much more than just a fact of which we need to be persuaded. It's not simply something we check off our list and, and, and move on as if it has no implications for us right now. If we do that, we miss the whole point. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus ushered in a whole new thing, 
a whole new life for his disciples then and for us now. And his resurrection is the fact upon which our faith is based. Without it, we have nothing. We are left dead in our sins and hopeless. As the Apostle Paul wrote, if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Without the resurrection, we have no forgiveness of sins, no peace with God. There is no daily communion with him, no fellowship with him. There is no purpose in this life and no inheritance in the next. Without the resurrection, there is no next. There's only now and a now without grace. To put it in theological terms, there would be no justification, no adoption as children of God, no sanctification, and no eternal life. So as we go through the details of chapter 20, I hope and I pray that we are thinking about what the resurrection means for us some 2,000 years after the fact. So I wanna go through and take a look at the details of this chapter and see what the author may be suggesting to us. Open up your Bibles again, please. Um, and I'm gonna start with the first verse. Now on the first day of the week, none of the gospel writers describe this day as the third day. They don't describe it as it relates in time to the crucifixion, as you might expect that they would, but they all refer to it as the first day of the week, perhaps as another way of signaling that a whole new thing has happened. This is indeed a new week, a very different week from any other week in human history, a very different day, a new day a fresh start, the ultimate do-over. Faith in the resurrected Christ brings the disciples out of the era of the Mosaic Covenant and into the era of the saving sovereignty of God mediated through the person of his son. In other words, this saving faith trusts Jesus as the resurrected Lord. And that is a whole new day. We are no longer slaves to the law, but we have been justified by grace through faith in the crucified, risen Christ. He has purchased our redemption by dying the death that we deserved. We are united with him in that death, but we are also united with him in his rising. For those of us who have placed our trust in his finished work, we have died with him and we have risen with him. He has bought our justification. So it's like when our names come to the throne of heaven, Christ who now sits at the right hand of the Father will show the Father his nail-pierced hands and say, she is mine. I suffered and died and was raised for her, for him. This is a whole new day. The first new day. John tells us that Mary came to the tomb early while it was still dark. It should be no surprise at all to us at this point that John is the only gospel writer who includes that detail. It was still dark. We have seen the way that John plays with the themes of light and darkness throughout this whole book. So to say that Mary came to the tomb while it was still dark is yet another signal to us. It was still dark, but it would not be for long. The light was about to dawn over the earth and over Mary herself. Her eyes would soon be open to the full reality of who her beloved Jesus really is. 
it was most certainly still dark in her soul, for she was deeply grieved. She had placed all of her hopes in this man who had delivered her from seven demons, had restored her and had given her a love that surely she had never known in her life. And she loved him, believed him, followed him, and now he was gone. And she didn't know what to do, how to begin again without him. And the darkness particularly relates to the fact that she still did not understand. She did not yet see, did not believe that her Messiah would rise. She didn't get it. It was still dark. She saw that the stone had been rolled away and she assumed that someone had taken the body. Grave robbing was common enough in those days that the Emperor Claudius eventually ordered capital punishment for all those convicted of destroying tombs, removing bodies, or even displacing uh, the ceiling stones. So it's not particularly surprising that Mary came to the conclusion that she did, that someone had taken the body. So she ran to the two most prominent of Jesus' disciples, Peter, and the disciple described as the one that Jesus loved, commonly accepted as John, the gospel writer. She goes to tell them with what she considered disturbing news. How interesting it is that what we so often think is disturbing news is actually good news, but we can't see it. How we read things so incorrectly, how many blessings we miss thinking that they're bad news. Mary read the greatest news the world has ever known as devastating sad news. How wrong we often are. So Peter and John ran to the tomb. They had an understandable sense of urgency, so they ran. It's a blessing to have a sense of urgency surrounding the things of Christ. We could stand a good dose of that ourselves. John was younger, so he ran faster and arrived at the tomb before Peter. He stooped to look, but he didn't go in. He saw the linen grave clothes evidence that no one had moved the body. I mean, if you were a grave robber, you're certainly not going to leave anything behind and you would not take the time to meticulously remove the clothing before moving the body. Peter arrived second and in keeping with his true nature, he did not pause. He impetuously went in he too saw the linen cloths lying there, but according to verse seven, he also saw the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Another thing a grave robber wouldn't choose to do. Apparently, the face cloth could not be seen from the ent entrance of the tomb. That's at least what the flow of the passage, passage suggests from verse 5 to verse 8. Verse 5 says, he saw the linen clothes, but makes no mention of the face cloth folded up by itself, which suggests that John did not see it himself until he too entered the tomb. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he came out of the tomb wearing his grave clothes, including the burial cloth wrapped around his head. But it seems that Jesus' resurrected body had passed through his grave, cl grave clothes, spices and all. Verse eight tells us that Jesus, that John rather went into the tomb 
and he saw and he believed. What he saw caused him to believe. Believe that this Jesus who had been crucified, who had entrusted him with the care of his own mother, had been buried in this new tomb, had now risen. He had shed his grave clothes and risen from the dead. John saw and he believed. The first man ever in all of human history to believe that Christ had risen from the dead. Imagine being that person. The beloved disciple saw and believed and John introduces this theme of seeing and believing that comes to its glory in verse 29 when the risen Christ says to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The next verse, verse nine says, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So John believed before he understood. John believed, although he did not fully understand the scriptures. Saint Anselm said, I believe so that I may understand. It was based on a saying of Augustine who said, for I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. For this also I believe, that unless I believe, I shall not understand. When John saw what John saw in that empty tomb caused him to believe. And I guess we can say that the tomb was not entirely empty because the grave clothes were there, a tangible piece of evidence linking Jesus' crucified body with his resurrection. And now there are two men who testified to what they saw so that their testimony would be considered evidence admissible in a Jewish court. The resurrection of Jesus opened a door of understanding that was very much helped, very much brought along by the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 25 and 26, Jesus says, these things I have spoken while I was still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Verse 10 serves as a transition telling us that the disciples went back to their homes. John went believing and according to Luke 24, 12, Peter went away marveling at what had happened. But Mary stood weeping outside of the tomb. She has not only lost Jesus, but she thinks someone has taken his body. And if the loss is not crippling enough, now there is insult to injury. They have killed him, but that wasn't enough. They had to twist the knife and take the body. She's probably thinking, I can't even mourn in peace. There's nothing but turmoil in this picture for her. And it's more than she can bear. Praise God that the risen Christ helps us with our wrong conclusions. As she wept, she stood to look into the tomb, maybe for the first time, and she saw two angels dressed in white, which by the way, she doesn't seem to be too freaked out by seeing angels. She is so completely absorbed in her grief and so bent on finding his body, she doesn't even seem to respond to the fact that she's in the presence of angels. Our grief 
and our despair and our determination to do what we think we need to do can be so utterly blinding sometimes. So they ask her, why is she weeping? This was not a question asked to get some information. The angels probably could not fathom why she was crying when such a glorious thing had happened. Christ has risen. This is a time for joy. Why cry? Consider the picture for a moment. They are inside the tomb. She's crying outside of the tomb, facing the tomb, facing the angels. And behind her is Jesus, but she doesn't know he's near. There is so much that we just don't see. Her answer reveals that she still holds on to this earlier idea that the body of Jesus had been stolen. It still has not occurred to her that he has risen. As great as Mary's love for Jesus was, her expectations of him were far too small as I suspect often ours are as well. She turns and sees Jesus standing there, but does not realize that it's him. Not only did she not know he was near, she didn't recognize him when she saw him, as was often the case in the stories of the resurrection. People often didn't recognize him. In Mary's case, she was so filled with grief and so fixated on finding his body, she missed his presence. I think sometimes we do the same. Then Jesus asks, woman, why are you weeping? The very same question that the angels had just asked her. You see, in the perfect world, where Christ and angels dwell, there is perfect harmony. The angels say what the Lord says. Why are you crying? Whom are you seeking? I imagine in that moment, Mary considered them merely the probing of a concerned stranger but later, as she reflected back on that conversation, she may have felt differently. The first question, why are you crying? It is a compassionate inquiry for sure. And we praise God that the risen Christ is so tender and so kind as to ask us why we are crying. While at the same time, it was a bit of a gentle rebuke the second question, whom are you seeking, shapes, it changes the way we see the first question. Why are you crying? Whom are you seeking? There doesn't seem to be any time elapsed between the two questions. It seems to me that they are very intertwined. Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Who is it that you think I am? Do you really know the true nature of this Messiah that you love so well? Did anything I said about rising on the third day stay with you? Did it penetrate? Do you comprehend what I am really all about? It seems this was Jesus' way of helping Mary think about the kind of Messiah she was expecting. And it was an invitation to her and to all of us to expand her thinking and ours, to expand her horizons and ours concerning him. For as devoted as she was to him, her thoughts of him were still far too small. Because of her unbelief, she was not looking for a resurrected savior. Why didn't she recognize him? 
Maybe it had something to do with the fact that she had been crying her eyes out and couldn't see straight, but I suspect it had more to do with the spiritual blindness that we all share outside of hearing the voice of Christ calling our names. One single word spoken as he had always spoken it, her name was enough to open her eyes because the good shepherd calls his sheep and his sheep hear his voice. Mary, she instantly knew him and her grief and despair turned to astonishment and happiness. Don't you just love to witness unbridled happiness? I do. In a movie, in a book, in real life, that moment of sheer, utter happiness is so glorious. And Mary has that moment. Upon hearing her Savior speak her name, she responds, Rabboni, which is a familiar form of saying Rabbi. It's like saying my teacher. And she's completely enraptured by the restoration of the most important relationship of her lifetime. But that blissful moment is cut short when Jesus says back to her, do not cling to me. Mary had probably thrown herself at his feet and was holding on for dear life. And he says to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but I but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Verse 17 is actually considered one of the most difficult passages in the whole New Testament to translate. It's so interesting that at the end of this same chapter, in chapter 20, Jesus invites Thomas to touch his wounds that he might believe. But here in verse 17, Jesus tells Mary not to cling to him. It's an interesting contrast. Thomas is invited to touch to help his unbelief, but Mary is told to stop touching because she still doesn't fully comprehend what's happening. She knows that he is alive, but she doesn't understand that he will not immediately disappear, nor that he will soon be ascending to his father, changing her relationship with him from a physical presence to a profoundly deeper one, a spiritual presence. Let me just first state the obvious. This is not a directive from Jesus telling us not to cling to him. It seems silly even to have to say it, but I've heard people imply just that. And we cannot extrapolate and say that because he told Mary not to cling to him, that we are not to either. The entire Bible tells us to cling to the Lord. Several places in Deuteronomy in 10.20, 13.4, 11.22, tell us to fear the Lord your God, serve him and cling to him. Joshua 2.38 says you are to cling to the Lord. Psalm 63.8, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. To cling means to hold fast. And because of saran wrap, cling is a very vivid word for us. We're told in Hebrews, also in several places, to hold fast to the Lord and that he holds fast to us. It's the same thing as saying, using the word cling. So what is he saying? Probably Jesus is saying a few things, not the least of which is, Mary, I know that you are desperately thrilled to have me back in bodily form so thrilled that you now don't want to let me go, maybe even for fear that you will lose me again. I have not yet ascended, so you don't need to be afraid that I'm going to disappear permanently right now. But this is not the time to hold on to me. Now is a time for joy. 
to share the news. Go and tell my disciples that I am going to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. I am ascending to my Father. Jesus ties the resurrection to the ascension. If Mary is to rejoice in his resurrection, then she must also accept and rejoice in his ascension as well. But you see, there is a most important point screaming out here to us that applies to you and I, and it makes all of the difference for our present and for our future. Jesus says, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Now, Mary didn't have to think long and hard about who his brothers were. She knew full well he was talking about his disciples. Jesus is telling us what his death, resurrection, and exaltation, which are all inseparably linked together, have accomplished. Because Jesus died, rose, and ascended, we now get to share in the sonship of the Father. He has made us his family with a shared father and Jesus as our brother, family, no longer even just friends, but brothers and sisters. John 15, 15 says, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. But here, Jesus has progressed even beyond that from calling the disciples servants to friends, but now brothers. You see, his death and resurrection purchased our brotherhood with him and with each other. Because he rose, we can be called children of God. And if God is now our father, and he is Jesus' father, then Jesus is our brother. And he says, I go to my God and to your God, to my father and to your father. Belief in the crucified and resurrected Christ makes you a beloved child of God. And as a beloved child, as Charles Spurgeon says, you are watched over, cared for, supplied, and defended by our Lord. You see, our Lord Jesus is ever giving. He does not for one second withdraw his hand or himself. He says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. The age, rather, the end of the age. His grace is always flowing. He is the bread of life, so his manna keeps falling. He is the living water, so he is always sending his streams in the desert. He is the light of the world, so his sun is always shining, even in the darkness. The resurrection proves to us that death cannot hold him. And since the King of Kings can never die, his grace can never fail. And if you are his child, his glorious grace is ever flowing to you. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you for your word, for your truth. We thank you mostly for your son, that you have sent the resurrect the crucified resurrected ascended exalted jesus christ 
who has made us his own, whose grace never stops flowing. Help us to work to walk worthy of him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.